So I would say, guys. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kate Festa. I am the supervisor of Special Education. Um, I'm just going to ask anybody on this call who is not speaking right now, if you guys can just mute yourselves because I want to make sure there's no feedback. Um, and I just want to welcome all the parents um, and students, guardians out there that are um, watching today's presentation. Um, I think this is an exciting opportunity for us to hear a little bit more about transition and getting our um, special education students ready for what comes after high school. So we have a lot of uh, presenters today. Um, we're going to hear a little bit from Western Connection, the Academy of um, Western Connecticut. We have um, the Department of Developmental Services here with us, um, a representative from the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services. We also have Ability Beyond, um, our judge from Proby Court, um, Naugatuck Valley Community College, and also Kennedy Center. So we have a filled evening filled with lots of information. Um, very excited to provide us with this opportunity. And um, also Mr. Kirsten in just a moment is gonna be sharing um, a link with you that you can use to um, input any questions that you may have during this presentation. Um, as a reminder, you know, we'll have each presenter kind of share first, and then at the very end is when we will open it up for questions and answers. Okay. All right. All right, Kate, that's your good. Okay, I'm going to present to everybody at home my screen. Um, and you'll have a couple different ways that if you have a concern or a question that you'll be able to ask it. So first at the bottom of the YouTube uh, station channel in the description, there's two, there are two links. Um, I should say there's one link and there's a telephone right number. So I'm just going to show you a couple things here. So as Kate had just said, uh, Kate's the supervisor of our special ed. Um, and we do have Sue, myself, Mr. Collentine, Ms. Pavone, Ms. Gross, Mr. Scott Farrell, Judge Mean, and John Borzales here as well. So the way that you guys can ask questions, there's a Google, excuse me, form. If you take your phone and you put on the uh, as if you're going to take a picture, but just don't take a picture, hold it up to that QR and the QR will, your, your phone will read it and then it will tell you, it will link you directly into a Google form. And if I click on that, you'll see on my phone, it says the DHS virtual transition fair. It will have uh, your name. And then it will also have your question down below. Uh, we're not gonna share your name, but we are gonna share your question with the group. Just below that code, the QR code right here is the Google phone and um, Ms. Refren will be manning that as well, okay? So just a couple quick things here. Um, our vision statement, Danbury High School aspires to be an equitable community that supports social, emotional, and cognitive growth so all learners can achieve their highest potential. And part of that is knowing all the services that you guys have the ability to access. And that's going to be part of what we're going to do uh, with this fine group that uh, is here tonight. A couple things about our school, we're about 33,000 
200. That was as of a couple of days ago. Uh, the number of languages spoken right here, right, 43. Uh, we have 233 courses. Uh, we have 62 interscholastic teams, 52 right clubs. And next year, we're going to have about 530 special ed students. Um, and every one of those students has the ability and the right to access uh, a, a lot of the stuff that we're going to speak about. Our special education staff that is here tonight, Kate, uh, again, who just spoke to you, she is the supervisor of special ed. Um, and then Dawn and Joe, if you guys want to unmute yourselves and just say hello to the group, I'm going to escape right here. And I'll go back over here quickly. So we have two guidance counselors who work with our special ed group. Um, one has been with us for a long, long time and Joe's uh, kind of new. So Joe, if you want to speak first. Uh, sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am the new guy, as Mr. Kirsten said. Uh, um, I am thrilled to be here tonight. I'm actually really excited to hear a lot of great information from our presenter. So hopefully I'll be learning um, not quite, quite as much as everybody else, because hopefully I've got a little bit of a leg up, um, but I'm looking forward to some great information tonight. Dawn, I don't know if Dawn is still there. She may have stepped away for a quick second. Um, so uh, if at any time during the get together, uh, if that QR code does not work again, if you call in, um, your question, you'll be able to ask that directly to Joe, okay? Um, so uh, the first person to present tonight, Sue, if you want to share your screen. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's just me. There's no screen. There's no PowerPoint. I'm just going to do my speech that I normally do, if that's all right. Um, but I do want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Uh, the program that I um, work with is called the Western Connection Program. And it is a collaboration between Danbury Public Schools and uh, Western Connecticut State University. Uh, the program has been on campus since 2003. We primarily are on uh, the Midtown campus. However, we do, do take classes and have some work sites over at the West Side campus. Um, the program is a two-year transition program for special education students, not only going to Danbury Public Schools, but surrounding districts as well. Um, we have three primary focuses in our program. The first one is educational. So students who are accepted into the Western Connection Program get to audit one class a semester. Um, the nice thing is, is it's not a, just a small set of classes that they get to pick from. It can be any 100 level class in any subject area, as long as the class is open and available um, as it would be to any freshman. Um, so while the students are auditing that one class, they get help from the Western Connection staff, as well as from peer mentors on campus. Um, they get assigned two mentors uh, for a total of three hours a week. Um, and the mentors help not only with academic uh, subjects and topics, but they also help with um, socially and to get students familiar with the campus. Um, students are expected to do all of the work of the class uh, that the class is asking, any papers, take tests. You do get accommodations as you would at, at the college level. Um, the important thing to know and to understand is that you are auditing the class. Um, so given the fact that it's in a transition program, it's for experience, for you to learn how to use those time management skills, test taking skills, um, to prepare you to go on to college. Um, we also, the second component of the program is our vocational component. So all students get jobs on campus. Um, we have a variety of different types of jobs from food service, sh shipping and receiving, mailroom. We have office jobs. There's a job in the accessibility office, the admissions office. We have library 
Um, and we also have um, the locksmith's office. So there's a wide variety of jobs to pick from. Um, and the goal is that every semester you get to uh, explore a different job. So by the time you're through the two year program, you have at least four different experiences working in four different areas. Um, and then our last uh, main component of our program is our social component. Uh, the students that are accepted into the Western Connection program are um, have the ability to attend any sporting events, any theater events, anything that's going on campus that um, any other freshman would be um, have availability for. We also have that availability. Uh, we um, we try to utilize that, utilize those services, and go to as many social events that we possibly can. Uh, the program as a whole, as a group, um, go does two social events a month, um, and the students also are expected to join a club on campus and go to the weekly club meetings. So, um, and the the university does a great job of offering what they call a clubs carnival for. Um, all of the clubs so the students can go and see which clubs are available um, and what days they meet and what times they meet. Um, we also do so a social skills group, a weekly social skills group, as well as a girls group and a guys group. Um, I could go on for a lot longer, but I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to let everybody know that um, we follow a similar application process as a normal student senior going um, applying to colleges. So if you're a junior right now and you're interested in the program, I am going to be sending out flyers for our open house shortly. Uh, but um, your, your September of your senior year is when you would start applying and we go through the process from September through to the end of the school year. All right, so thank you. I'm going to present my screen again. Um, for all the parents out there, one of the things that you should know is that uh, Sue's program and mine are uh, peop the students are placed there through the PPT uh, uh, through school through the process of the PPT. Uh, the academy program is a post secondary community based uh, vocational right program. We have students from the age of 18 up to 22. And we service Petco, Naugatuck Valley, City Hall, ShopRite, Berkshire Foods, TJ Maxx, St. James Church, Cardis, we hope still, and Central Office at Beaverbrook. Uh, our school day is a regular school day. We come in at 7.20. Uh, we do a, uh, a group get together every day. Uh, we cover budgeting, checking, uh, we cover the, the ability to interview, your strengths, what you do well, what you need to improve upon. Um, and then at about quarter to nine, we go out to the sites. Um, there's a job coach out there. And then at about one o'clock, we come back and we debrief um, with the students. And then um, it's about every other week, sometimes it's back to back weeks, but every other week, we also go out into the community. So last year, a few of the things that we did went to the police department. We had a wonderful tour there, the fire department, the mall, JK's diner. Uh, we took a wonderful tour of the Hart Plus Depot. We, we went to the Christmas tree shop mall, um, went to Stu's. And then one of the first things we actually do um, in conjunction with the moms and dads is we go to People's Bank. And if any of our students um, want and don't have, we actually open up a checking account for our students. Uh, last year, once a week, we also get together at night and we have actually students who come back to us and some of the activities that we do there, we, uh, we went to watch a um, uh, same thing, we went to Bounce, Texas Roadhouse, we go out to eat. We go out to Applebee's, the mall, we bowl, and we also uh, watched a couple uh, flicks last year. So again, what's different between between our programs is uh, 
based on recommendations from the staff and moms and dads, uh, the students will be sent to us. And again, they're with us uh, from the age of 18 um, and they can stay up until the age of 22. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna hear from the agencies. DGS will be up first. Marcus. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, okay, I wanna, I wanna start with DDS eligibility. Uh, to be eligible for Department of Developmental Services, you need to be a resident of the state of Connecticut have a full IQ score of 69 or below and deficits in adaptive behavior. You could also have a medical diagnosis of crater willi syndrome and your disability must originate during the developmental period, which means prior to age 18. Um, our application is found online. It is a PDF. You complete it by printing it out, um, compiling all the stuff that's indicated on our checklist and then you make a copy of it, one you save for yourself, and then the other you would forward to DDS. Um, it is on the website where you mail it to. You can also email it and scan it to us. The process takes about two to three months from the time you mail out your application. You'll get an eligibility letter in the mail um, if eligibility is denied, you have 60 days to appeal that. And I would suggest you do it right away because the, tox, the clock starts ticking immediately. Um, also on our website is the application for those with an IQ of 70 or above and autism spectrum disorder. Um, that department, although we review the eligibility, that ASD department is under the Department of Social Services. Um, what DDS has to offer you. Okay, so you're registered for DDS and you're about 18 or anytime after 16, actually. We actually have people who visit our respite centers. We have four in the West region. If you are eligible for DDS services, you are eligible for respite. Um, some people choose one of our respite centers. You are also eligible to receive respite in home if need be. Uh, that could be accomplished by applying for a family grant. Anybody who is eligible for DDS services is eligible for family grants up to $4,999 per year. That doesn't mean you get that every year. That means you may submit um, a request for a grant for something disability related and you might receive a fraction of what you requested or the whole thing. They need to make that funding last all four quarters so it's equitably spread amongst everybody. Um, what you are entitled to, um, you, uh, you can engage one of our occupational therapists, our physical therapists, behaviorists, or nurses on a consultation basis. Um, you can also uh, speak with one of our transition advisors, which I am. There are three transition advisors in the West region. If you are in the Danbury School District, I am your transition advisor. Um, So really the first step we talk about in transition planning is at 17 and a half, we talk about exploring guardianship. Um, DDS gets involved in the guardianship in that we are notified through a local probate court of an application and DDS sends out a team of two to interview your son or daughter. Uh, we may do that at your home. We may do that at a school. Right now, everything's done virtually. Um, you can also, as all, Alternative to guardianship, you can explore conservatorship or power of attorney, but DDS only gets involved in the guardianship piece. Um, so you can start that as early as, as 17 and a half, um, and DDS will provide an assessment to the court. That way at age 18, when your individual reaches the age of majority, you will have guardianship in place if it's approved by the court. Um, after you have guardianship and you turn after your age 18, we encourage you to apply for 
SSI, Supplemental Security Income. We encourage that at 18 because then it is based on your income and not your parents' income. Um, after you are approved for SSI, and sometimes you get denied, but please appeal that. But after you approve for SSI, we recommend that you apply for Husky C. Husky C is the Medicaid waiver, which DDS is going to receive 50 cents on the dollar from the federal government regarding services rendered. So absolutely, before any individual exits school and is assigned a case manager, in order to receive a case manager and to receive any of our grad funding, which occurs after the age of 22, um, you need to apply for, without Husky C in place, you will not be receiving a case manager and you will not be eligible for the grad funding. So that is very important. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't delay that past the age of 20, actually. You know, you wanna make sure that Husky C is in place. We do a lot of collaboration at DDS. Often we collaborate from the, with the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services regarding employment. Most tracks through DDS, most of our programs have a uh, vocational component to them. Um, we understand that not everybody uh, can work and it's a family decision. And if a family tells us, you know what, we're, work isn't part of our son or daughter's future, we respect that and we move on. Um, once you're assigned a case manager, and that will typically happen during your last year in school, what we encourage you to do with your case manager is to complete a level of need assessment. And that will basically dictate your funding uh, for your graduate funding. So your annualized funding past age 22 with DDS. Now that level of need assessment can be visited, revisited every year. Um, and even more often, if there's uh, an individual has is hospitalized, if there's behavioral episodes, uh, medical conditions, there's a number of things wherein your case manager can revisit it and reassess your level of need. Um, we also have uh, some of the some of the programs we work or we have service providers qualified service providers and on our website there is a qualified provider list and it shows you everybody the state of connecticut and dds contracts with to provide those services and some of those you'll be hearing from today it's the kennedy centers the ability beyonds so when you go on that qualified provider list on the DDS website, you can see all of these organizations and see what types of services they offer you. Um, and that's about it. Um, I plan on putting my um, phone number, my name, phone number, and email in the chat dialogue. So um, if anybody needs to contact me, feel feel free and you can also contact the school they're familiar with me and they have my contact information as well thank you uh okay and next we're going to move to miss pavone uh as a quick side note we actually work with miss pavone uh our group of 18 students we work with leah each week so leah welcome mm -hmm. thank you Thank you. Let me see if I can figure this out and how to present now. Um, oh, I did it. Okay. Um, okay. Can can everybody see my screen? I'm just yes. gonna. Get, okay. I'm just gonna get into the slideshow. Here we go. Okay. Um, so hi, my name is Leah Pavone. I work for the State of Connecticut Bureau of Rehabilitation Services. Um, BRS is uh, an agency that provides vocational services. So as Mr. Kirsten always says, when you think BRS, think work. So that's who we are. We provide services to help individuals become employed. 
Um, we have an, an adult services side of things. And through the adult services, um, we help adults with disabilities obtain employment and help with um, you know, some other, a variety of services to help individuals secure permanent employment. Um, just to give you an idea of how we're structured, we are the, you know, we fall under the Department of Aging and Disability Services. Um, BRS is one of the many um, agencies that fall under the Department of Aging and Disability Services, or ADS, we were called. Um, BESB, which is the Board of Education Services for the Blind. And just to confuse you, because we are the state of Connecticut, there's another DDS, but not to be con confused with the agency that Marcus represents. This is the Disability Determination Services. Um, and then, you know, right down below, you it also lists another, a number of other agencies um, that also fall under ADS. I'm not going to get, get into them, but this is where we fall within the organization of the state of Connecticut. Um, so I work for a program called Level Up. Um, Level Up was created about six years ago, and it was in response to federal legislation, though, which we call the WIAWA, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Um, this changes the way that we provide public VR services to students with disabilities. So who do we serve? We serve students who are between the ages of 16 and now it's 21, um, who have an IEP or a 504 and are potentially eligible for our adult services program. Um, Individuals who come through Level Up do not have to apply for eligibility. If you meet these requirements, you're potentially eligible, you're a student between the age of 16 and 22, and you have an IEP or a 504, all you have to do is fill out a simple form and enroll in our program. So what are our services? Our services um, are pre-employment transition services. So it's all of the services that you or a lot of the services that you may need in order to prepare for competitive employment. Um, you know, we also provide linkages to the American Job Centers or, or the AJCs as they're called. Um, and I will facilitate with you know, getting students hooked up with our adult VRS program. Um, so why was this pr program created. It was created to help students with career advancement um, and to also improve some student outcomes. The federal government had looked at student outcomes um, throughout the country and saw that there was a lot lacking and um, we wanted to have a program that addressed the needs of the student population. So what is Level Up? As a consultant, um, in planning for the future for their child. Um, you know, so that would be considered guidance and counseling that I, that I can provide to students and families. Um, I provide self-advocacy instruction, job exploration. Um, so through job exploration, sometimes I meet with students one-on-one. -on -one. I have access to different vocational assessments, um, you know, that I can administer to the students and just to kind of really get it, uh, you know, provide that student with some guidance on how to prepare for the future. Um, you know, choosing the career um, and figuring out where to go from here. We also provide a work-based learning experience, which means it's a, it's pretty much like a, a short-term part-time job. Um, we're, we're approaching right now our, our summer, which is our big season for work-based experiences. So right now we're prepping students for working, um, you know, part-time jobs this summer. All of our work experiences are, um, you know, entry-level employment. So the idea behind the work-based experience is that students are, are getting that entry-level experience, that first job experience. Jobs are all entry-level. They're, you know, 
what their peers are doing. So sometimes we get asked, well, you know, could you develop something very specific? And sometimes we can, but for the, for the most part, we stick to those entry level experiences um, because it's just to give students that, that taste of what it feels like to work. All of our experiences are paid. Students get paid a minimum wage um, and the expectations are of a competitive job. So students may work 10 to 15 hours a week. They, they may work four hour shifts. Um, it's, it's, you know, the employers have the same expectations that they would of any other employee. We do provide on-site supports. So if you have a student that requires some, some extra supports on the job, learning the, the job tasks, we will provide assistance with that. Uh, and another service we provide is workplace readiness, um, where I meet with students and, and we, we work on how to prepare uh, for, you know, the expectations of work. Okay, who can participate? As I said before, uh, any student ages 16 to now 22 who has an IEP or a 504 um, can, can um, enroll in our program. Um, if a student is interested, you should speak to Mr. Kirsten, Ms. Kernahan, um, and, and they can help get you started. The best time to connect is two years prior to exit. So when we say exit, we mean leaving school. We don't mean graduation. So if, if your student is going to stay in school and you know this until 22, the best time to enroll the student is when they enter the transition program. However, if you have a student who's going to take that diploma and leave the school system after senior year, then the, you would want to enroll your child um, when they're entering junior year. Okay, important to know, we do not provide transportation. Um, since we are preparing students for competitive work, um, transportation will be, you know, up to them, up to the student to, to get themselves to and from work. Um, you know, but we do provide assistance with helping them learn um, the public bus route, you know, by referring students to, um, you know, for travel training through the Kennedy Center. Um, a lot of times also in the, in the transition programs, I know Mr. Kirsten does this in his program where he uh, works with students in, in learning the, the public bus routes. Okay, so how are service deli services delivered? Well, we do a lot of things, you know, in groups. So right now I work with Mr. Kirsten's class at the Academy and Ms. Kernahan's class at um, Western Connections. And I think pretty much the whole class in both of those classes, they're, they're all on my caseload. Um, so now that we're virtual, I meet with the students every single week. Um, I talk about a variety of topics. We, we talk about um, a lot of like the workplace readiness, like skills that you need to get a job, interview skills, um, you know, how to, how to make a good first impression how to um, you know, present yourself for that interview? What are the expectations at work? What you know, appropriate behaviors at work? Problem solving on the job. Um, and we all, then we talk about self-advocacy. We talk about disability disclosure in the workplace, why you would wanna disclose, how you disclose. We talk about um, disability disclosure in, in colleges, you know, who to talk to, how do you disclose, what documentation they need. Um, you know, a variety of different topics like those, you know, we talk about um, on a weekly basis. When things were normal before COVID, um, I usually met with the groups about once, uh, Ms. Kernighan's class about once a month and Mr. Kirsten's about once a quarter. And when he was talking earlier about going out into the community, um, they actually came to my office in Danbury. So, and we met in my office. We had a big conference room and I met with all the kids. Um, and that was really great because they learned where we are located 
and we're actually located, um, our Danbury office is in the same building as the Department of Social Services. So they got to see where, where DSS is located and where we're located. So when they graduate and they come and or they exit the program and they're ready for adult services, they already know how to get to our office. Um, and they, in some cases, they were able to meet the adult counselors and they were able to, to ask questions and get to know the adult counselor right there when they were meeting with me. Um, the work yeah, I'm going to interrupt you for just one second. I think that your slideshow is not, um, we're stuck on that very first slide that says work-based oh. learning experience. Um, so I just want to let you know that, that we're not seeing what oh. you're doing. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to get out of it then because you know what? I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> oh, it, it looks like it just up. So now I see level up activities. Okay. How about that? Okay, there we there go. There you go. And now how our okay. service is delivered. So I think. Okay. Great, great. Um, okay, so so we had. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, so so I do deliver services during the um, the school day, but we also deliver services. Um, on vacations, um, during the summer months, you know, obviously the work experience is after school. Um, we also have some paid groups. I run a lot of groups and that's really important for, for, you know, giving me the opportunity to get to know the students so I can provide appropriate guidance and counseling. Um, my groups tend to be, you know, just a little unstructured. I might just come up with a topic and we're, we're going to, we discuss it for the day. But then we also contract out with agencies like Ability Beyond, and they have a more structured curriculum-based um, program that they will do with our students. So, you know, Ability might come in and do a, you know, a four-hour um, service of, of workplace readiness or self-advocacy. And like I said, that's, that's more structured than what I do. Okay. Okay, and then this is this is just um, an overview of some of our different um, activities that we have through Level Up. Uh, we also provide some informational interviews, um, job shadowing opportunities, which means students actually go out into the community. They um, they might meet an employer, have an opportunity to ask questions, might you know shadow. Um, at a work site just to see what that job is like. Because a lot of times kids say, well, I want to do this, but then they really don't really understand what that means. So informational interviews and job shadow opportunities are really great in helping kids get that hands-on experience and actually get more information regarding different careers. Um, okay. Um, so, just to give you a little bit more information about our work-based experience, the we give a total number of hours for the work-based experience. So this summer, and you will never hear me say this again, ever, but this summer we have a lot of money and we're, we want to spend it. So, but I don't think anyone's ever heard me say that as a state employee, but, but this summer we can say it. Um, so this summer we're offering students 80 hours of a work experience, which means they, they can work about 10 hours a week for eight weeks. In the past, we've done work experiences for 40 hours, 60 hours, but this summer is the, um, it, it's, it's really great. It's 80 hours, um, but that varies every single year. So next summer, it may not be 80 hours. We may be back down to 40, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know. We, we know these things, you know, you, from year to year. Um, so we do prioritize students who have no work experience. Um, right, we prioritize students who are exiting next year. Um, but other than that, you know, this summer we're 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 giving a, a really nice experience. Um, here is my contact information. If you, if you would like to contact me, um, we are not in the office right now because of COVID. I suspect we will be in, in, in a few more months, but I, I'm not sure. 
But um, so please don't call my office because I'm not there and I won't get the message. But that cell phone number that is there is my work cell. And I do have a, my work cell with me all the time. So please, you know, feel free to call me on that number uh, or email me, of course. And that's, and that's it. Okay. Stop well, sharing. Thank you, Leah. That was wonderful. Um, our next speaker is going to be from Ability, which is Kathleen Gross. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us tonight. So my name is Kathleen Gross, and I'm from Ability Beyond's Career Development Department, and I supervise um, individuals funded with BRS, DDS, um, and private pay contracts. So I'm just going to go over some of the other stuff that we do as well. Our mission at Ability Beyond is to discover, build, and celebrate the ability in all people. Our organization is dedicated to empowering every person, no matter their ability, to have the opportunity to live, work, and thrive as an integral part of their community. For well over 60 years, Ability Beyond has pioneered the ways to help thousands of people with physical and mental disabilities to discover their abilities and become an important part of their community. Uh, as of today, we actually have helped 3,000 people benefit from our services across New York and Connecticut. We're always trying to be at the forefront in developing innovative programs and best practices that are being recognized and adopted on a national level. Uh, through our groundbreaking programs in the community, job training and placement, supported living and rec recreational and educational enrichment, we empower the individuals we serve to live full and rewarding lives. We're always trying to go beyond to ensure that the people we serve have bright futures, a place to call home, enjoy independence through work, and have a forever home where they can age with dignity. We work with a large variety of funding sources to support post-school services in Connecticut. To just name a few, the ABI program, um, your rehab services, the Board of Education and Services for the Blind, DDS, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, the Social Security's Ticket to Work program, and as I said earlier, some private pay contracts. Ability Beyond is an employment first agency, <coughs> excuse me, Employment first is, is defined as employment being the first and preferred outcome, regardless of the level of disability. Everyone, no matter where they are receiving services, whether it be day program, trans transition, individualized day, will be working on an employment focused goal. Individuals with disabilities should have the right to work in real jobs, earning a real wage, which is essential if citizens with disabilities are to avoid lives of poverty, dependence, and isolation. Have the right, if able to work in a job fully integrated within the general workforce, working side by side with coworkers without disabilities, earning a minimum wage or even higher. They should also have the right to access um, for assistance to support and ensure job success if they require that support. Have the right to pursue and the full range of available employment opportunities and to earn a living wage in a job of their choosing based on their talents, skills, and interests. Uh, through some of our employment programs, we help the individuals we serve by training them for fulfilling work opportunities, providing job placement assistance. We work very closely with Leah and some other level up counselors at BRS. We also work with the DDS funded individuals for um, sometimes to find the job, but they also provide the long-term supports on the job. Our dedicated and experienced staff will design individual strategies to help meet each person's employment goal. <clears throat> we provide group supported employment, career development services, work readiness, just kind of piggybacking on what Leah said, some of those uh, work-based experiences, self-advocacy classes. Um, we also have customized employment. We pride ourselves on customized employment and always kind of um, adding more tools to our toolbox. Assessment services and job shadowing through Connecticut and New York. 
as a part of the Social Security Administration. His Ticket to Work Employment Network, Ability Beyond, is also able to assist individuals in reaching self-sufficiency through full-time work and going off entitlements, if that is their goal. Our employment supports include assistance with career exploration, resume building, job search, networking, assistance to find the right opportunities, online applications, interview preparation, assistance with disclosure, negotiating reasonable accommodations, initial onboarding and intensive job coaching to ensure success, ongoing long-term job counseling and coaching, assistance with developing natural supports in the workplace, and career-driven goals. We have a very holistic approach to seamless transition. Ability Beyond's transition services empower people with disabilities to build their careers and create brighter tomorrows, discovering their unique interests and strengths, expanding their networks of support, creating opportunities for experiential learning, achieving their personal goals, career exploration, internship opportunities for real work experience, and volunteer experiences to build their resumes and networks. Our team decides, once a team decides on the individual is ready, that the individual is ready to get a job in the community, Ability Beyond will work to secure funding for the employment specialist from career development to work with that individual to find and secure that employment. Depending on the individual's specific needs and funding, and the person may find a job and work competitively in the community with continued supports. Um, BRS is short-term support, so they would help the individual, fund the individual to get the job, support them to get up and running on the job, and then if they did qualify for DDS services, the individual would to transfer over to DDS funding, and that is the long-term job support. We also find the job and work competitively in the, to work competitively in the community with job coaching supports, transition to our individualized day program. So like I said, we're an employment first agency. If the individual wants to work and that is their goal, but maybe they can't work by themselves, maybe there's a safety concern, we do and have individual day funding through DDS. And that's where staff would be with the individual while they're working for that one-to-one -one support. We also like to make sure that each individual, also given their goal, has a full week. So maybe they only want to work three days a week and go to day program the other two days a week to maintain those social skills. We can also, depending on um, their needs and their funding, also look at that scheduling too. Daily activities of a day program might include visits to parks and zoos, go hiking, attend sporting events, arts and crafts, theaters, photography class. Right now with COVID, we do a lot of um, virtual classes, but then we do have some individuals on site. I believe we're doing half day programs right now, and we're looking on expanding more individuals coming back to program in person and extending those days. For example, they all meet at nine o'clock at the hub. That's our main building over in the corporate park. Um, they do a morning sharing and social activities. At 10, they participate in recreation or volunteer opportunities. 12 o'clock, they all have lunch together. One o'clock, they'll go to the park for a group hike. And at three o'clock, they're usually on their way home. With our transition program, so that is also like a day program, it is essential for the individuals to take the sweetheart bus to transition because in transition, our main goal is employment at the end. So that gives them that independence to already know how to navigate the sweetheart bus. Um, so designed to allow the individual services and the goals to be met, they all take place in the community, supported one by one staff. If it's a, a day program, recreational activities, going to the gym, the movies, volunteer, like we said, transportation, behavior supports, enhanced supports when needed, and also residential programs. All programs due to COVID do have a decision tree at this time. Individuals must um, meet some criteria like being able to tolerate and wear a mask, temperature checks, ability to maintain social distancing, Obviously that's not always easy. So at least being able to be prompted to follow the social distancing rules, um, like I said, reduce capacity in the buildings, the remote option. We do have enhanced cleaning of all program space and buildings, reduce community outings, 
from the day program into transition services. We've really been trying to think outside the box to, um, in order to get individuals back. I believe they've been back since like September in person. Um, but we've really been trying to think outside the box to get more individuals back and being creative with space. A lot of us in, um, you know, like an administrative department are working from home to allow space for individuals to come back. And that social piece is very, very important. Um, I believe the DDS representative Marcus went over it, but it's all looked at as the level of need, the lawn score um, to be eligible for one of our day programs. So a one to two is usually ISE, and that's where I supervise that and the individual supported employment. So very career driven, wants to work, needs some assistance, maybe on work for the check-in. Um, lawn two to three is a transition program or as well, IZ, they really want to work. And at lawn four to five, transition program, but IZ should be at least, we like to talk about it a lot um, at their team meetings. Let's talk about work. Anytime IZ is mentioned, that's work related. And then a lawn six or more is a day program. Um, that's all I really have. Right. Thank you. Kathleen. Um, for everybody who is at home viewing this, remember, you will be able to watch the tape version as well. Um, so uh, there's lots of great things here, stuff. Uh, Scott, you're going to be up next. Naugatuck Valley. Thank you, Bill. Okay. So, good evening. My name is Scott Farrell. I'm Assistant Director of Admissions here at Naugatuck Valley Community College, Danbury Campus. Um, just going to take you through a couple of slides, give you a good idea of who we are and what we do. So, um, this is where we are located on the corner of Main and West Street. Actual entrance is on 7 West Street. We have 20,000 square feet, 12 classrooms, three computer labs, a health lab, student lounge, faculty office, and two conference rooms. So again, we've uh, expanded. We've been here now 11 years in Danbury. This facility on uh, Main and West, we came to about three and a half years ago and uh, it's going real well. Uh, we were outgrowing it for a while. Uh, COVID uh, slowed us down based on not uh, having classes, um, but it looks like for the fall, we're going to be uh, back to having classes on campus. A lot more right now we're doing about 10% uh, of the classes, and uh, we expect uh, a lot more participation by students. So some facts, we are accredited by the uh, New England Association of uh, Schools and Colleges. We have over 6,000 students, about 1,400 at the Danbury campus, uh, over 100 different degrees and certificate programs. We also have learn to earn programs. So these are short term programs to learn a skill, anything from CNA, welding, manufacturing, bookkeeping, um, PCT, patient care technician, pharmacy tech, bunch of things. We are uh, open enrollment. So anybody who wants to come can come. Uh, however, if there is a prerequisite for a course, uh, you need to meet that prerequisite to be able to take it. Uh, we're very affordable, $2,258 per semester or $4,516 a year. So why should people attend Nagatup? Well, again, our professors have office hours, so they're there to uh, be able to help you and assist you. Uh, we do have free tutoring through what's called the ACE, Academic Center for Excellence. So again, between these two things, uh, you're not in this alone. Uh, we have the tutors are both professional tutors and student tutors. So depending on what level of tutoring uh, you require, uh, we have about an 18 to one student ratio. We do have the free bus pass. So again, uh, students who have learned how to use that heart bus system, uh, they can take it to get here. Uh, they Once they have their pass, if they are leaving here and need to go to work, they can use the pass to go to work. So I think it fits into a lot of the things we talked about here and making sure employability, but also, again, getting them some skills. 
and then uh, credits transfer. So if you take credits here, uh, we are originally accredited. Uh, so you can take them to other schools. Um, if you complete here and now you want to go to say Western, get a bachelor's degree, you could do that. Or again, if you went to another state, you'd be able to take the credits with you also. And so we have a very easy admissions process. It's an online application. You fill it out, um, need some basic information. So there is a copy of your transcript. So we have an idea of how you did in classes so we can identify what level of math and English we'll start you with. Um, we also need immunizations, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella are required. However, if a student is at the high school, they probably have that already and can get a document from the student, the school nurse that shows that. So we do have a disability services office. Terry Latella is our uh, counselor there. So she's the one who will review the IEP 504, any psychological testing that uh, has been done, and then be able to use that information to um, figure out what kind of accommodations uh, might be required uh, and would help the student out. Again, the law from the high school to the college, a little different, fall under the Americans with Disability Act. So um, there are certain things we can, can do, but um, not everything that you might have had while you were in high school. So most important is that Nagata Valley uh, students achieve their goals. So again, that's I think the most important for us to know about your student is you know, what is the goal? What is the expectation? What are we trying to do uh, to help them get there? And if you have any questions on it, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, we are on a rotating basis being on campus, so calling is probably not the best because I'm not always here. Right now it looks like Monday and Thursdays, but based on uh, schedules and things that happen. But if you email me, no matter where I am, I always have access to my email. So um, if anybody has any questions, please uh, write them out, send them to people there and I'll be able to answer them or you can reach me individually and I'll be glad to help you out in any way I can. Thank you so much. Have a great Thank night. You. Scott, uh, that you can tell the uh, professional at this event and out, man. It's, it's so much around. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Judge, Beth, you're up next, please. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Judge Diane Yamit. I've been the probate judge in the District of Danbury for 31 years, and I'm really pleased to come back here again to present with all of you. I wanted to uh, thank Bill Kirsten for putting all this together and my fellow presenters, and also the families who are joining us tonight. It's really been a difficult last 18 months or so. And so I just wanted to encourage you, if you have a lot of issues or concerns or, or facing a lot of challenges, feel free to re reach out to your school system, to DDS, to any of us on the panel uh, for referrals and for support. We are an, an amazing community and we're very blessed with so much support. So always feel that you're not alone. Um, so I'm, I don't have any um, paperwork to hand out tonight like I usually do, uh, but I do want to refer you to the probate website. That's the most important thing I'm going to tell you tonight because everything I'm going to tell you is online and you can easily access all this information. And the probate website is www.ctprobate.gov, G-O-V, like government. So it's again www.ctprobate.gov. All our forms are online. There's a wonderful eight page user guide on guardians, you know, appointment of guardians, uh, all the court directories and phone numbers. And the courts are open. The probate courts, um, although the Superior Court did close for a period of time, the probate courts never closed during all this pandemic. We've continued to do our business and we've been operating our hearings through Web, uh, Cisco WebEx. And people that can't access the WebEx suddenly can call in for hearings. Uh, the courts are always available. And uh, just to remind you, the courts consolidated a few years ago. There's 54 courts. Danbury's jurisdiction is purely Danbury. And if there's any residents of um, Northern Fairville County Probate Court, that's basically the towns of Bethel, Newtown, Bridgefield, and Reading. And then a Housatonic Court serves a number of towns, New Milford, Bridgewater, Sherman, Brookfield, and New Fairfield. But all this information is online. Um, I'd like to start really with just uh, reviewing the couple of the definitions 
So um, the probate courts have the authority to appoint limited guardians or plenary guardians of the intellectually disabled. We also can appoint standby guardians. So in addition to appointing the guardian, we can do a standby. In the event the guardian becomes ill or incapacitated, then the court can, upon learning that there, there has been an issue, can, the court can quickly appoint that standby that's already in place um, through the court system's prior hearing. Um, and uh, the court also notes that um, the definition of intellectually disabled ex is extremely important. Um, and the intellectual disability uh, also requires a, a, an IQ of 69 or under, just like DDS has the requirement for their, uh, those who are, who are within their jurisdiction. Um, so for 69 and under, um, and then those, those are the cases that we can uh, appoint the guardians limited or plenary. Um, if someone has a, a, an intellectual disability of over 69, perhaps in the case of autism, um, again, there's other avenues appointing, uh, having the individual have a healthcare representative appointed or having a power of attorney done, which are uh, not under court supervision. They're simply done with, through the attorney's office. Um, there's other avenues, including having a conservator appointed of person or estate over finances. Um, so these are other avenues that are certainly available. Um, but all the definitions are in the Connecticut General Statutes and online. And the protected party, we refer to the uh, individual with the intellectual disability as a protected person, uh, also sometimes called a respondent. So the, the, I also want to remind you, uh, there was some additional legislation a couple of years ago. Um, previously, the guardians had ability to make decisions over um, health and health decisions, housing, other services, um, but this included now an expansion to allow the guardian to handle and monitor finances. And so that's a new part of the uh, process where they can apply to handle finances, especially if the individual is going to be uh, having a job or receiving um, Social Security benefits. Um, this allows them to have the authority to, to manage that, those finances for the individual. Uh, and that's a new part of the process. Um, so as far as how to apply for a guardian, whether it be limited or plenary, um, the simply, and again, you go on the probate website, and there's the w, uh, PC 700 is the application uh, to appoint a guardian of a person with intellectual disability. And you use that form either to ask for a limited or a plenary guardian. And it's broken down into different areas. And the limited guardians is where we appoint them on, over maybe just certain areas like medical. A plenary guardian would have decision-making in all the areas. So the PC 700 is the application form. Also is required is the non-refundable $250 filing fee made payable to Treasurer State of Connecticut. Um, there can also be a fee waiver uh, by the petitioner's fee waiver if the person who's filing, usually the parent, uh, qualifies. Um, also, the call it another form called the respondent's fee waiver. And that respondent's fee waiver is so that the court-appointed attorney um, will be paid by the state if the person with a disability uh, meets the criteria to have a, a fee waiver granted. And the fee waiver is a PC-184A. Um, and then there's acceptance forms, a PC 7705. Again, all this is online. And the acceptance form shows that they're willing to serve. Um, so we, we do need these applications in place. Um, the, 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 I told you there is a new statute a few years ago to allow authority over finances. So it's a PC 7007. That's the application for the uh, authority to handle finances. Um, but usually you file all these documents at the same time. The court will order a uh, assessment by D DDS. And once the assessment is received, uh, we have a court appointed attorney represent the, the uh, protected party. The court will conduct a hearing. Now it's of course on WebEx and the attorney will appear, the, the family appears with the protected party. The court conducts a, a hearing simply to review the assessment, uh, review the IQ, hear the report of the court appointed attorney and, uh, and, and hear the family, the family uh, what their requests are. And at the end of that hearing, the court will be able to appoint either a limited guardian or a plenary guardian, or will be appointing uh, a standby guardian. Uh, and these guardians are under court supervision. We have review hearings every few years, um, and they do need to let us know if they're moving or any, any major circumstance changes. So there are guardianship reports that are due. Um, and as far as the finances, once they're appointed, um, the court has the ability to waive any accountings. We know that often the families are doing accountings for Social Security. Um, so we don't always have to require uh, accountings, and we can waive that. 
Um, the other requirement, if it's over financial uh, authority, uh, the person's assets have to be under $10,000. And if their assets are over $10,000, they really need to go the route of having an application for a conservator uh, appointed. Um, so that's pretty much the gist of it. Again, all the information is online. Again, I'll give you our probate website, which is uh, www.ctprobate.gov. And you'll find all the uh, forms and information online. Thank you so much. Great, Judge, thank you. And uh, last but certainly not least is the Kennedy Representative John Wardzala. I hope I said that right, John. Yep. Uh, yes, it's Wardzala. It's actually uh, Ward is in Guardian and Zala is a river in Austria. So if you put them together, it's Wardzala. That's how you pronounce oh. it. And you did. Uh, so so thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm going to share this. I'm not sure if you could see anything. Um, but before, let's see. Um, let me select. Training. Here we go. Um, so before we uh, before we kick it off, I'd like to uh, tell you two stories. Um, one is their their success stories of the uh, transitional students that we work with uh, in terms of travel training, and I'll get into travel training, um, the the nuts and bolts of it in a second. And I apologize, my camera's not working. I think it's burned out from all the zooms that we've done over the past year. But again, part of COVID has taught us to be agile and adaptive, and that's what we've done at the Kennedy Center. So. Speaking of which, our travel training program, it's fantastic. So one of the stories is we had a, a transitional student, and again, we're all over the state of Connecticut. He lived in Milford. He loved um, Mark Twain. Um, just the, he, he just adored Mark Twain. So he learned that the Mark Twain's house is up in Hartford. So he was taught to take public transportation from Milford, where he lived, all the way up to Hartford, um, and that included you know, multiple buses, multiple transfers, two trains, Metro North, um, the Hartford line. And now he he goes up there and he volunteers his time. So he doesn't ha even have to go up there. This is what he does. And that I would find it, you know, pretty daunting to, to take that. That's at least an hour away. And again, as they said, there's transfers, et cetera. But he worked with us and this is what he's doing now and he really loves it. Another uh, Example, um, a recent example is right before the pandemic, we taught an, uh, the person, um, she had cortical visual impairment, so she wasn't completely, she didn't have a complete loss of sight, but she did have some some vision. Um, and again, if they have complete loss of sight, uh, they use Besby. But this person, um, she lived in the northeast portion of Connecticut. And again, we work with all the transportation districts. So she learned to take a, a bus um, to a, she got a job at a grocery store. Now, what was interesting about this was the bus in that area only shows up every two hours. So if she missed that bus, she couldn't go to school. I mean, she couldn't go to work. And even more so, if she missed the bus coming home, you can imagine what would happen. After the pandemic um, arrived, she became an essential worker. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So she, she was able to continue on doing what she had to do, uh, which was, you know, ma maintaining her job, taking the bus, um, uh, to and from work, and she she got to be a an essential worker. So, um, and she's still doing that as we speak right now. So it was a uh, it was a great success story, um, and it, we're continuing on that. So I'm going to try to uh, launch this, and it says uh, I can't share my screen, but that's okay because what I'll do is I'm I'm just going to talk. It's basically just words up there anyway. Um, so our travel training program. Um, it's been, we work with transitional students for this instance, it's a free program. We're all over the state of Connecticut. Um, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, if there's public transportation by you, we're there. We've had this program since 1991 um, and we've trained over 5,000 people in the state of Connecticut on how to take public transportation safely in their community. And our number one goal for the travel training program is to teach individuals on how to use public transportation safely and independently. Safely is our, our, main, uh, our main focus. And the program is for individuals that are already dependent in the community and if they like to learn how to use public transportation safely, basically is the two examples that I gave earlier, it, it just opens so many new doors of, of independence and, and confidence. I mean, and all our travel trainers are, are so passionate uh, about what they do. It's just a fantastic program. All the trainings are one-on-one. -on -one and the trainings are scheduled um, when the individual is available. So 
it doesn't matter where you want to go. The travel training destinations can be anywhere. They could be to workplaces, schools, colleges, medical centers. You, know, you have to go to the doctors, house of worship, the mall. Um, we're just training someone. They wanted to uh, go to their uh, uh, girlfriend's house to meet to meet them. We can do that. It doesn't matter where you go. Just like for public transportation, when you get on a bus, bus driver doesn't ask you where you're going. Same thing with us. You know, you just give us a destination. We'll be there and, and we'll help you. It's not a rubber stamp program, meaning it's a it's a process. So we we graduate people um, that after we will go through a specific process, and if they're not ready for it, they're not graduated. But again, we've had uh, persons with um, all types of um, intellectual, cognitive, sensory, physical disabilities, and we're training. I've uh, been training a, a person. Um, she's a wheelchair user since the fall, and she just graduated. So again, we it doesn't matter how long it takes to train someone we're just we're just interested in one their safety and when they're comfortable and when we believe that they're ready to take public transportation and by saying that we go out we've been going out and during the pandemic we you know obviously wear uh ppe we, we practice all all the the cdc guidelines and we also go out in the rain and the snow and you know in inclement weather and you have to do that because again when you have to go to school and you have to go to work you don't have a choice. You can't say, ah, I woke up and, you know, the, the cloud, it was cloudy out or it was raining, et cetera. It doesn't matter to our travel trainers. We'll be there and we'll encourage you to get where you want to get and you'll you'll learn how to take the, uh, the bus or the train. So what is taught? It's basically self-advocacy, trip preparation, street, cost, street crossing safety, um, what to do in case of an emergency, and, you know, how to properly use bus transfers, as I mentioned before. And the bus fare, this is really cool. So we work with the Department of Transportation. We work with all the transit districts in, in the state of Connecticut. And because we have a relationship with DOT, typically uh, an adult fare, because again, if you're over 18, it's $1.75, depending on where you are in the state of Connecticut for this, but for this purpose, let's say it's $1.75. What we have to the state of Connecticut is if the person has a disability, um, they they work with the Kennedy Center and they can get it's called the reduced fare ID card, and at the end of this, you know, my, my talk, you can feel free to, you know, to contact me, and we can, you know, we can show you how to do that. But what's great about it is you only have to pay fifty; you get fifty percent off of the bus fare or the train fare. So you can imagine the savings you get, you know. And again, this is also applies to seniors as well, including those that persons with have disability. But if you're taking a train from New Haven all the way up to Hartford, you get fifty percent off. So if you're going to take public transportation to your job, you get 50% off. So that that's that's a huge savings. What our program does charge, we don't we don't charge, but the only tr uh, price that you do have to pay is when we're travel training, you will have to pay your own bus fare, right? So again, when when we start working with you, we get you the the the, uh, the reduced fare ID, it's 50% off and you know, you, you can't beat that uh, you can't beat that price. It, it's it's a fantastic, and it's a one-time fee of five dollars for this uh, little card, and it's good for your lifetime. If you lose it, it's ten bucks. But again, that that's a little nudge not to, not to lose it. But again, we help work with you to get the card. It takes about two weeks, um, and it's a it's a fantastic savings. And and again, it's a it's an incentive to take public transportation. Um, so it it's great. And the, and again, the outcome you get skills that are confidence confidence builders and, and the independence that you get that you need to where you, to where you want to go so you're not stuck in the house and you're not asking for for, for people for, for rides. And what we do also, after you graduate this program, we don't like, okay, that's it, we'll, we'll we never talk with you again. We actually have follow-ups. So our travel trainers, they would contact, you know, a trainee that has graduated uh, one, six, and 12 months after the fact to see how they're doing. So let's say you have a, an evening course coming up in, let's say the fall, hypothetically. Well, then your spring course is in the morning. No no problem. We'll train you and reach wherever you want to go. Any new destinations, let us know. Again, there's no fee and we'll train you, continue you know, to expert. Because again, nowadays in terms of the public transportation, um, things are changing rapidly, as, as you all know. And you know, certain times there's bus schedules that are changing, et cetera. And as a good, as a positive, um, this summer, public transportation um, is going to be free on weekends. So again, I mean, what what better 
you know, an incentive is that to learn how to take the bus. And again, we're open, you know, 12 hours or 12 months a year. So if you're interested, please contact us. We'll be happy, uh, happily, happy to do the travel training. And again, um, any new destination at any time you want, um, it, it's fine. And how this process works is you just send us an email. And again, I apologize for my, my screen sharing. Actually, is, is anything showing up right now? Nothing? Okay. All right. That's what happens. No problem. So again, just, you know, when you contact me, we'll be more than happy to send you a referral form. Um, you know, you just fill out the referral form. You send it back to us. Uh, we'll get back to you. We'll, we'll start an intake. And that's it. Now, what I like to offer, that that's my 10-minute uh, presentation, but what I really like to offer everybody, um, it sounds like a commercial on TV, but what we do is we, we also offer a presentation during the pandemic. It's called a travel training guide. So after we have a presentation like this, you, know, you get some people that are still on the fence. Well, I'm not quite sure about travel training during the pandemic. We get that. Again, we've been going out during the pan throughout the pandemic. Again, we're none of our travel trainers have, have gotten COVID. Um, so we, we've been, you know, we've, we've applied by, you know, the CDC guidelines. But what we do offer is for those that are on a fence about it, we want to keep the pulse going. We want to keep the excitement going. So we have this presentation. And again, we, we, we typically, um, I would say it's about 15 minutes. We would send you a Zoom credential. You would Zoom in. Um, and if the person doesn't have internet access, no problem. What we do is we print out the PowerPoint presentation. We'll have a phone call and we'll just say, go to page one, page two. And what this travel training guide is, I, I can't explain enough how, how invaluable it is. It basically talks to the, the either the parent or the guardian and it alleviates fears and concerns. We go over all the steps that we take to do travel training. Um, and then it's a leave behind. <clears throat> it's like if you go to the doctor's office, you don't remember any, most of it when you when you leave. This is, a, it, it was initially set up as, as a booklet. Um, and this is what we did after we met with the parent, the guardian or the representative, we would leave this behind. So now what we do is, you know, thankfully through technology, we would send you the, the PDF when we're done. Um, but again, we go through all the aspects to ease any of the anxiety um, with, with the person um, that, that's about to be travel trained or if they're on a fence about it. So again, we'll be more than happy to do a presentation again in the evenings, during the day at, at your convenience. And again, that, that keeps the interest going because what we don't want to say is, oh, okay, after the pandemic, we'll, we'll call you. No, we're, we're slammed in a good way. We're very busy. So the, the sooner you contact us, you'll get on the, you'll get on the list and we'll be more than and happy to, to do a presentation for you. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please please let me know. And again, we'd be more than happy to do a presentation and equally happy to do travel training for you. And again, we're, we're throughout the state of Connecticut. So if there's a transit district nearby, uh, we're, we're on it, uh, pun intended, and we'll, we'll help you get to where you wanna go. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, one of the things, for everyone who is at home watching, I am reminded of, of, of not only all the wonderful um, things that are available through DDS and BRS and Naugatuck and the Kennedy Center and Ability, but also the, the, the people, most importantly, who work there um, and working with them for, for quite some time now. If you have any questions or concerns, please get in touch with your uh, teacher, your case, uh, the, the case manager at school and they can either get in touch with me um but but it's been a pleasure to work uh with these folks uh, uh we've had a couple questions about um if you didn't get everything that you needed tonight uh you can use the same link tomorrow um and you'll be able to watch it um so if you want to go back in and just kind of watch it and pause it and just to uh, write things down. Um, Joe, was there a couple other questions there? Yes, there are. Um, a few of them are sort of specific to individual students. So we'll, we'll really just follow up with the, those students or those families individually. Okay. Um, the one question I think that might be a little bit more useful um, in general uh, Mr. Collentine, there was a question, if somebody needs to follow up with DDS directly, uh, if they've been 
waiting for a response or need to get in touch with someone, uh, what's the best way to do that, to reach out to DDS? Uh, the best way to reach out to DDS is either contacting the West Region Helpline, which is 1-877-491-4444. Or by contacting me. And my phone number is 203 448 3537. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that was it um, for this for the general questions, Mr. Kirsten. Marcus, one question that I had. Uh, what's and I think I think that you would touch on it. What's the difference? if uh, your son or daughter um, is autistic um, in terms of the process I, I, and in terms of the, of the uh, time that you apply and then the time that you actually start to receive services as opposed to somebody who is, uh, um, you know, 69 or below. Was, was that too vague? Okay, I, it's, it's a little vague, but um, essentially, if you are accepted under the ASD division, which is under the Department of Social Services, there is a waiting list. Um, I do not know how long the waiting list is. I'm not sure when services commence from the time you apply, um, but I know it's lengthy. I believe it's years even. So my, my best advice would be to get on the waiting list as soon as possible. And I can't speak to when those services begin, um, but the bulk of our services, uh, the grad funding and all those things take place at age 22. Wonderful. And then Ms. Wone, uh, there was a question about um, do you, do do the kids who take who get assigned um, a place to work do they get paid? Is that a paid? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The kids um, will get paid minimum wage. Actually, um, minimum wage right now is twelve dollars and ten cents an hour, but August first it will be going up to thirteen dollars an hour. So what we've decided, because it would just be a fiscal nightmare to pay kids 12, 10 until August 1st and then give them a raise, we decided that we're just gonna pay them $13 an hour for the entire summer work experience. Wonderful. And then Scott, there there was a question for Nalga Talk. Um, could you just briefly just, just touch on the difference between if, if you go to Naugatuck for one of these certificate programs, as opposed to if you want to get your associate's degree. Yeah, no problem, Bill. So the biggest difference between a certificate program, which most of our certificates are usually a year long, and a degree plan is the general education requirements. So a certificate is specific to what that area is. So I'll give you an example. If we look at horticulture, so I'm going to come in and get a horticulture certificate. You will be taking horticulture classes. Those are the classes that you need. And you'll take them for the two semesters and you'll meet the requirement for that particular certificate or manufacturing, automotive. So there's a lot of different certificates that are out there, but you are, there's no requirement to take the math, the English, history, social science, um, that are required for a degree. However, if you do start off as a certificate and then later on down the road, you decide, okay, yes, I do want a degree. You can go back and take those degree classes and then you would be able to earn an associate's degree. So it, it, it they, they still work together, but you can take it separately. Wonderful. And um, Scott, or all the, uh, if I want to get a certificate in X, and then somebody else want to get a certificate in Y, are they the same number of things that they have to take credits or classes? Most, most certificates are usually, they still require um, two semesters. 
So yeah, they're going to be somewhere around 30, 32 credits that are required for it. But again, each program has uh, broken it down. It is available on the website. Our catalog is there. In the catalog, it lists all the different certificates so you can see exactly what courses uh, are required. Um, and you'll know, okay, if I, I want this certificate, I need to take these courses, these courses, and then I'll have the certificate. Gotcha, fantastic. And then Judge, um, a parent today asked, uh, they had the guardianship up until the age of 21. And then uh, as we were talking about, um, if she wants to, can, can she reapply to get the guardianship of her daughter since it expired? I wasn't 100% sure the way she explained it, but the way that she explained it was that when, when her daughter turned 21, she, she, she lost it. Does, does that kind of sound right or not? Um, so the, the guardianships, um, first of all, you can apply up to six months prior to the 18th birthday, but uh, we can't appoint until the 18th birthday. So typically it only takes like you know 90 days or 45 days for the assessment. So even applying like three months before the 18th birthday is sufficient. And these guardianships, um, many times they apply for them, um, not only when they're 18 or 19 or 20, but even older. Um, we've had guardians appointed when the person's 40. Um, so there is no expiration of these guardianships. Um, they do they do continue. Um, their certificates of appointment may expire. So they may have a certificate showing they have this valid certificate for one year and they need to, they need to apply for a new certificate. And, and if someone asks us for an updated certificate of appointment, we're gonna check and make sure that their file is up to date, that they follow all proper guardianship reports that are due and that they've notified of any address change Etc. So we'll make sure the file is up to order as we always do when we do our review hearings. Uh, but there's no need to reapply. Gotcha. Kate, did do you have anything that you want to say just to kind of wrap things up? Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, thank everybody for um, participating again, um, all the presenters. Um, there was a wealth of information. Um, I'm sure that parents have been taking furious notes. Um, and so I really do um, appreciate everything that was shared. Um, Judge Yarman, I think it was you that stated earlier what a difficult year this has been um, for everyone. And so I appreciate, you know, everyone um, taking their time, uh, many of you out of your personal lives um, to participate in this and for parents for taking the time um, to join. I also encourage you, I think that a lot of this information is just kind of the basis and the foundation for what we, um, for what many of you as parents may need um, to really um, fully understand all the ins and outs of each of the um, agencies that was discussed and programs that was discussed tonight. So I encourage you as you look through the information and um, research it more to um, kind of reiterating what Mr. Kirsten said earlier, you know, reach out to any of us on this panel, um, the school staff, especially myself, Mr. Kirsten, um, your child's school counselor, their case manager, um, special education teachers, we might not have all the answers, but we know these individuals on the line will. Um, so if we don't, we can help to connect you and get the answers for you. Um, so um, thank you again. And I hope everyone has a wonderful night. All right, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.